just go ahead and we'll give a warm applause for Marta. She's here to talk to us about classroom management. Uh, and then Marta, I'll just kind of let you take it away. But if you could introduce yourself to us, who you are, what you teach, and the most important question, if you were a circus act, what would your talent be? And the floor is yours, Marta. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome. I'm glad to be here with you guys. Um, I am Marta Chavez, and I teach at Grand Terrace High School. And what I teach are all medical classes, medical terminology, medical front office, medical clinical. And um, to me, teaching is a lot of fun. And I like to enjoy teaching, and I, and, and I have a lot of things. If I were a circus act, honestly, I would be a juggler. I juggle things back and forth constantly, multitask, and do so many different things that that would be that would be my my one thing that I would definitely be good at. So our topic here is uh, classroom management. And a lot of us are teachers that have just started. A lot of you guys are just going to go into the classroom. And you know that there are a lot of expectations. And you can go through some of these, or we can see some of these, and there's so many things. And this is why I say we, uh, I'd be a juggler, because we have to begin the school year with a plan. We have to make sure that we go into the classroom and basically start class immediately. We have to be well organized. We have to be structured. We have to be prepared in that classroom. We have to be able to manage um, and reduce any discipline problems that happen. We need to have our students engaged and working. We need to make sure that we teach the procedures and responsibility. Like in my class, the medical class, when we're doing hands-on, they have to be very responsible. They have to be uh, respectful. They have to be um, respect each other and the teacher. They have to be able to respect their uh, patients and understand them and culture. So there's so many different things that they need to do. So our students are juggling a lot of things, just like we are, especially now. And all these things go together, plus the fact that we're coming from the outside and other things will be happening. So, you know, you never know what's going to happen and how we're going to do, uh, do things. Um, so dealing with at-risk students, improving uh, student learning and achievement, these are all things that we really need to think about, that we really need to know how, how to plan for, how to understand. But can you know who's going to be acting up or who's going to be good we don't know that it's our attitude i feel that makes a a difference to me classroom management can be a puzzle of the, especially at the very beginning uh, when i started teaching i was just thrown in there i didn't we didn't have tip at that time I think I would have appreciated having something like this, which I think it's so awesome because all the people who are there, all the people who help you, who guide you through everything, they're amazing. They're so awesome. And if you look here, I put this particular puzzle piece here, classroom management puzzle, because these are all things that we have to do. But the main thing is being consistent. And so we have our rules and procedures we have to follow. We have to put them up there. We have to tell our students. We have to let them know. We have to engage our students, like I mentioned earlier. We have to be effective with our relationship with students. And yes, all of us will have relationships with our students. Every single one, whether it's good or whether it's bad, but there's still relationships. Um, recognize adherence and organization. Um, I'm gonna be the first one to tell you organization is very important. Um, having a particular order you need to do, having everything set up in the right way, you're having the steps that you want to do for um, your classes, and we're all teaching CTE, meaning we're all specialized in our field that we're teaching. And so, you know, if you're teaching welding, you know, you have to make sure you're on top of it. You have to make sure they follow the rules. You have to make sure there's no accidents. Same thing with my clinical class, with my medical. They have to know what they're talking about. They have to know the terminology. They need to know the steps. They need to know the procedures. So everything has to do with organization. So those things are extremely important to follow. 
Um, the one thing I would like, I want to tell you is please feel free if you have a question, if you have a comment, all of you, let's make this interactive. Let's talk about it. If you have questions or something that has happened or hasn't happened or there you, you're nervous about or you want to learn about, please feel free to ask questions and talk. And sometimes the people that are with you there, if they've been teaching one year, half a year, they may have a, a response or an answer to something that, that you have, a question that you're asking. So how do we manage the expectations? That's the question, right? Let me ask you, how does it feel being a first time teacher? How, how do you think you handle it? There's so many things that you're doing that you're going to be aware of that you have to multitask. It's not an easy thing to do. And you're all crybabies. I remember hearing that term, crybaby. It's, uh, and I think it's true because everyone's learning for the first time. Everyone's getting together to get everything going. Everyone has to make sure that you follow everything properly. What do teachers do? I love this here. One of my students sent me a card that had this information, this on it. Now, I would like you guys all to read it quietly and think about it. What do teachers do? You notice the first thing there says inspire. I have been told by uh, many students, I inspire them. And sometimes I wonder myself, I'm inspiring you? How do I inspire you? You know, so this particular student told me, Ms. Chavez, all of this is you. And I said, what? Really? And she told me, yeah, you're persistent. You celebrate us. You love us. You plan everything. You're, you heal. And I asked her, why do you heal? Why do you say I heal? And she says, well, it's a medical class, first of all. But her particular thing was she came in one day and she was very sad and I told her you know what I'm here for you if you need to talk and in this particular day her father had passed away like two days before and she came into the classroom because she didn't want to be home and then afterwards I told her you know what you want to come in at lunchtime we can talk and we did and then after we talked, you know, she would come in every once in a while just because she was sad or she wanted to get something out. And, and then after that, she stopped coming in and everything was good. After she graduated, she sent me a long letter. And she told me that just the fact that I listened to her, that I took the time to tell her that this is hard, this is difficult, but everything was going to be okay. But it, everyone heals at their own pace. This is why she said, this is what she felt I was. But this is all of us. This is every single one of you. And I think at one point or another, every single one of you is going to experience this. What are we doing right now? Professional development, right? What do we do? We meet new people. We learn every single day with our students. We read. I know for a fact, we all care. I have cried with them. I have laughed, laughed with them. And I do teach, which we all do. What do you guys think about this? Don't be shy, you guys. No comments? OK. <clears throat> Marta? Yes. My classroom's coming in with some stuff. Okay. Go ahead. Um, sometimes, like, if you look at that list, it feels, like, overwhelming. Like, where are we going to find the time for that? Mm-hmm. Um, but I know just from my own experience, like, it just happens organically. Like, just in your day-to-day -day classroom, you know, hustle and bustle, like, those things will just, they just come out of you. It's just the, the 
the willingness to do those things when the opportunity comes up. Like that's what's important. Like you don't have to walk around thinking like, okay, Marta told me I have to inspire and persist and nope. celebrate and love and play. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I have to check it all off. But um, just being willing to do those things, like that's, yeah. that's more than enough. That's more than enough because you know what? The students feel your love. They know. If you care, they know. If you're upset, they know. If you're hurting, they know. Um, you're all brand new and you don't know my story, but I was really ill and I became paralyzed. And after that fact, it took me almost a year to get back to walking and doing everything normal from that illness. And uh, in the classroom, I tell my students the story especially all my new students, because I'll tell them, you know what? Sometimes you'll see a walker in here and sometimes you're gonna see it's really hard for me to stand. It's really difficult for me to walk. Sometimes you'll see me like nothing's wrong at all. Like nothing's ever happened because that's part of my illness is due to the nervous system. And as I was sitting there, the students learned about the, the illness and different illnesses, especially with medical terminology and as they go along in the class. So I really feel that they should know. And all of these things, it's interesting because I inspire my students to do all these things and they do all these things as well without even realizing they're doing it. All of us teachers will do this and it's not about multitasking. It just comes out of you. Absolutely. 100%. It just happens. And the more you experience, the more you work with the students, the more it's going to happen and you don't even realize or recognize that it happens. It just comes out. Exactly like you said. So, the, but I will tell you one thing, the organization is something that we have to work at. So it says here, a picture is worth a thousand words. What does this picture tell you? Yeah, they're focused. They're focused. They're like they are focused, <laughs> yes. And they're working individually, right? Yeah. So it looks like the students are engaged. What about this one? They're still engaged. They're still engaged in a different format, right? Yeah. And this is our goal here, to be able to have our students working hard and being engaged. And whether they're working by themselves or whether they're working in groups. Now, what do you prefer your students to do? Work in groups or work on their own? Both, 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 both. Exactly, great answer. There are going to be times you want them to work in groups and work together, and there are going to be times you want them to work by themselves. Because if they're taking the test, do you really want them to be taking it together? No. No. If they're doing a hands-on, whatever it happens to be, can they work together? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. So in my classroom, most of the time they're working together. And you want to know one thing that I do that I really love and I really enjoy? I'll be teaching my class and I'll be, um, for example, teaching the heart, how the heart works, how it pumps and it goes through the body. And I make them tell me orally. It's not just about learning it, doing it on paper. I quiz them orally and I'll tell them, okay, tell me the pathway to the heart. But some of them learn really quick and some of them have a difficult time. So at that point, I will tell them, you know what? You, Mary, you learned this and you know this by heart. I want you to take these four students here and work with them and teach them how to do it. And Sometimes they'll look at me like I'm crazy and they'll say, but Ms. Chavez, I can't teach. And I said, no, it's okay. Just tell them how you learned it. That's all I want you to do because they can't memorize it. They can't figure it out. So tell them how you learned it. And then I tell them, it's okay though, because you're going to become the expert. You're going to be the teacher for me right now. And they look and they get nervous and then they start. And then they come back and they say, oh my God, Ms. Chavez, this was so much fun. Can I do it again? And what I tell them is, when you're teaching this to your classmates, one, you're helping them. Two, you're really 
reiterating this, which means that you're learning it, you're memorizing it, you're not going to forget it, you're following through and you have it down. And then because of them, they start teaching. And she'll, this one particular student told the students that she taught, she said, okay, see them, they're having a hard time. You go over there, you go over there, you go over there. And before you knew it, each one had a leader, each one was learning them. And I started calling them up and every single one of them knew it. And not because I taught it, I wasn't working that hard. They taught it. They helped each other. They learned it. Was I observing? Absolutely. Was I going around? Absolutely. When I checked, I told them, oh yeah, don't forget this step and don't forget that step. But to me, that wasn't working. To me, that was, I mean, of course we're working, but to me, that was fun watching, observing, seeing what they're doing, seeing how they're actually learning together and helping each other. Do you call that teaching? Yes or no? Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is teaching. But you know what I did there? Instead of me standing up there and lecturing, instead of me saying this is this and this is this and follow this, I had them not only learn it, I went over it with them one time. I showed them this is the way the pathway of the heart goes. You need to memorize. Here are the steps. Use this blank heart diagram and mark it down and start saying it orally this is how it goes and the fun thing was the funny thing is when i was asking them tell me the pathway of the heart the students would close their eyes and say okay super superior vena cava inferior vena cava into the right atrium to the bicuspid valve into the and they closed their eyes and they were imagining the diagram how cool was that they knew what they were doing. And when, they, when I gave them the actual test, the diagram test, they were able to fill it in with no problem, 100%. So a picture is a thousand words. They're engaged, they're following through, but it doesn't have to be one way. There's no one way of teaching is what I'm trying to say. All of us are different. All of us have different things. The important thing is trying to keep them engaged, trying to keep them going, making them helping them understand that they're all able to work together and help each other. And it's not you doing all the hard work. Is it hard work creating a lesson plan? Yeah, of course it is. I hate lesson plans. I do it, but I hate it. But I follow it and I, I do it well. But helping them each other. In my lesson plans, I don't write down, half students help the other student. You know, things happen spur of the moment and you need to be able to work spur of the moment and that's okay. Teaching is not just following it by the book. It's about, I feel, enjoying everything that you do. Now, these are classroom management areas that I feel are very important. You could look up and you could have so many different things. And if you ask every teacher, every teacher has different things. But I found in my time of teaching which I've been teaching 19 years, that these four things are very important. The policies, rules and procedures, the time management, being able to work with student behavior and our resources. So I'm going to go right here. What are policies and procedures? I actually wrote this down because I felt that we need to we need to be able to understand rules and procedures. They convey a message that you are, as a teacher, are there to teach your students. You're there to learn. They're there to learn. They give students the structures they need and also help them feel that the classroom is a safe and predictable place. Why do you think it's important to make it a safe place for them and for you? Should it be a safe place? Yes. Yes. Do you know that a good amount of students don't feel safe at home? There are many students that come to, the, to school and that's where they get their structure. That's where they get the feeling of love. That's where they feel 
comfortable or at home because at home things aren't good. And when you smile at them first thing in the morning, when you greet them at the door, or even when I'm sitting at my desk, they'll walk in and I'll say, good morning, so-and-so, good morning, how was your day? Or I'll make different things or I'll make a little joke or I goof around with them a little bit and they smile and then they have a good day in class. I have actually noticed that the more, the more I smile, the more we laugh, the more I joke around with them, the more happy and more comfortable and the easier they work. So here I have rules and procedures. I'd like you guys to take the time to read it for a few minutes quietly because you need to know the difference between a rule and a procedure and why they work together. So a rule identifies general expectations or standards. And a single rule can encompass a wide range of expected behavior. So you can put one rule that is talking about a lot of different things. A procedure explains the expectations that you have for specific behaviors. And effective teachers actually use both rules and procedures. And this is not, these are not my words. This I got from ASCD.org, and it actually explains how I feel. Now, of course, I'm talking about the things that I feel are important, that are what I have used, and these are it. This is it right here. So, What do you guys feel about the rules and procedures? Do you guys feel that these are things that are important? You guys can talk. You know. Okay. All of you guys have a, a list of rules that you guys put up on your, on your walls, right? And you guys have things that you expect them to do? These are some things that I expect my students in my class to follow. First of all, first of all cell phones. They're allowed on campus, but I tell my students, it shouldn't be disruptive to others. It shouldn't go off in the classroom and it shouldn't be used without my permission. Because I notice that if I don't give them that clear rule, they're allowed to have, they're allowed to have cell phones. And I have some students that tell me, oh, Ms. Chavez, I need to have it on because my mom calls me. And I tell them, if your mom calls you, you can turn it on during the break and you can call her back right after. But what if I have an emergency? I had a student who likes to, um, who liked to talk back, always had a question, always why, why, why? So I just said, you know what? The phone, there's two options. You either, all of you guys will bring your phone up here and put it on this table and pick it up or you keep it in your pocket and you keep it off and don't use it because if you use it, I'll take it. And when they're using it in class, sometimes I'll just have fun with them and I'll just say, you know what, take out your phones. And they'll look at me like, what? They'll take out their phones and I say, okay, we're gonna use the phones today. You're going to get, you're gonna look up and do your research, but you better not be texting because if you're texting, I will take it away. And I will walk around and I will do that. But you know what? So far, my kids have been really good. When I let them use the phone, they will actually use it for their research. And sometimes, unexpectedly, we'll be doing something and I'll look at them and I'll say, hey, why do you have your phone out? Ms. Chavez, look, I'm doing my research. And I'll, and I'll see it and I'll go, oh, okay, then you're good. But let me know next time. And they will tell me, those who have had me before, they already come and tell me, Ms. Chavez, I'm gonna use my phone so that I can do the research on here, okay? Okay, that's fine. And then I'll just go for a run after, but I better not see you using it on something else. Okay, okay, that's what they tell me. They know what I expect. Signing sheets. As soon as they walk in every day, they walk to the section where I have a board with the signing sheet and they sign in every morning. 
So signing in, and I tell them it's a professional environment. This is your work attendance. When you're working, you are actually in this classroom, you're actually working and I'm going to have you be responsible. You sign in, you sign out. They sign in if they walk in and they put their initials and the time they walk out of the classroom. And the benefit for me about this, my benefit is that if for some reason they're absent and they say they were not absent, I tell them straight up, you know what, don't even tell me. Get it, bring it to me. If you signed in, you were here. Now, sometimes I'll see them and I'll take the attendance and everything and I'll see them walk in and they don't sign in. And of course I mark them here. But if I missed it for some reason, they have the sign-in sheet and they can show me, Miss Chavez, look. And they've gotten to the point that they'll come and they'll tell me, Miss Chavez, I was, you marked me absent this day, but look. And they'll just bring it to me directly and say, look, I was here. Oh, okay, I'll fix it. And I just fix it, it's not that hard. But I did have an occasion where a student came in and she was out of my classroom five days, alternately. And she came in into my classroom yelling and screaming and say, Miss Chavez, you marked me absent. I can't walk because of you. And I said, okay, you know what? It's not the time to talk about it. Let's talk about it after class. And she yelled at me and she said, no, I'm going to do it right now. And I told her calmly, I said, no, we're not going to do this right now. We have class right now. You either sit down or I'll just call the office and I'll have security come and get you. And she just looked at me and she said, you're gonna do that? I said, is this the time to talk about this? And she looked at me and she said, no, and she sat down. But here's the thing, she went to the AP office and she complained about me. And she told the, the principal, and she went to the principal and told him, Ms. Chavez won't clear my absences. And so he came and talked to me and he told me, Ms. Chavez, can you explain to me what's going on? And I said, yes. This young lady came into the classroom. She uh, started yelling in front of everybody. I did not want to disrupt my class. I asked her to either be quiet and sit down and do the work or that I would send her to the office or I would call security. And he said, okay. He says, that was the right thing to do. That was his first comment. And then after that, he said, so what about the absences? And I said, oh, this young lady says she was here. I know she was not. I told her to show me after the fact, and she didn't want to. And obviously she went to you and she didn't come back and talk to me, but they all know that they have to sign in. This is what we do in the classroom. And this is a follow-up attendance. And because they sign in, there's no argument. She was either here or she wasn't. What do you think the principal said? Okay, cool. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the principal told me, you know what, Marta, I'm going to back you up because I've known that you always do that. They always have to sign in. I've come in and I've seen them walking directly to sign in. And if she didn't sign in, that's her fault. And the young girl looked at him because she was there. And she said, but Mr. And he said, no, did you sign in? <laughs> And she just looked at me, he said, did you sign in? And she said, no. And whose fault is that? And, he, and isn't that the routine? He asked her, isn't that routine? Yes. Do you sign in every day? Yes. And did you sign in those days? No. <laughs> then were you here? And then she put her head down and she said, no. That was the end of that. The interesting thing was that the students the next day said, Ms. Chavez, what happened? She was so rude to you. And I said, it's okay, guys. It's okay. Don't worry. You know, she said, but you were so calm. I wanted to yell at her for you. And I said, I'm glad you did. <laughs> and they just all looked at me like, but you were so calm. And, I, and then I told them, I said, what would have happened? I used it as a teaching moment. And I told them, what would have happened if I had raised my voice like her? What would have happened if I lost control? What would have happened if I decided to become unruly? 
What do you what do you think would have happened in the classroom? Circus. <laughs> <laughs> you know what would have happened in the classroom, right? Uh -huh. All the students would have been talking, all the students would have been trying to put their opinion, and I lost control of my class, and there would have been no continuing the class after that. So by you being in control and calm, collected, not responding to the attitude, not going that way, it stayed calm. And I was able to do what I needed to do. And because I stayed calm, the principal said, do you really think I'm going to believe you over her when nothing happened, everything was calm, there was no issue? And of course, I have my proof that she didn't sign in. She wasn't in the class. The other thing I do is when they sign in and they're here and they signed in the whole week and they've been on it the whole time, at the end of the week, I'll either give them a choice to, I always have snacks in my classroom because a lot of them come in in the morning, haven't had any breakfast. A lot of them come in, they have no food. And, and they'll look at me and Ms. Chavez, and I'll tell them, you know what, you guys? This is me. I have snacks here. If you guys are hungry, and I tell them at the beginning of the semester, if you guys are hungry, if you guys have a snack, if you guys left the house in a hurry and didn't have breakfast, and I will tell them, you know, sometimes I leave and I forget. I don't even have my coffee. And you guys know how I love my coffee and I'll raise up my cup. And then they laugh and they'll say, yeah. I said, so just come and tell me, Ms. Chavez, do you have a snack? And they will come up. And they will tell me, Ms. Chavez, I didn't have breakfast. And they'll whisper, can I have a snack? And I'll just go get it. And they get it. And they sit down quietly and they eat their snack and they throw their trash away. And then the next day they'll come and they'll say, Ms. Chavez, thank you so much for having that snack there. Am I telling you guys to do that? No, absolutely not. I'm just saying this is what I do. And again, I've had the experience of other students, you know, coming in and they're not having food. And I've had the experience of students coming in, tell me, Ms. Chavez, you know that so-and-so hasn't had anything to eat for three days? And the child doesn't say anything. And then I'll tell them, okay. I'll talk to them and I'll give them food and I'll tell them what to do. And I'll tell them what to do. And, you know, and I'll tell them, hey, don't forget you guys. You guys can have a snack whenever you guys want. Just come and get it quietly. You don't have to tell me why. If you're hungry, just come and get it. And you know what? The best thing is it allows them to work. After they have the snack and they feel they're not hungry anymore, they feel comfortable, and then they get right into their job. They get in right into working. So this is what I do. I have the expectations. You guys have a question or comment? All right, we'll continue. <laughs> Those are my policies. Here are my rules. One of them is no gum chewing in the classroom because it drives me crazy when they come in and they start chewing gum. That's the first thing. The second thing is so unprofessional. So this is one of my rules that I have. No chewing gum in the classroom. The second one, and I totally get them on this all the time. No profanity allowed. No bad jokes, no anything that's going to put anybody down. And you know how every other word is an F word? Yeah. They really, they really get on it. So sometimes I play a game and I'll call them up and I'll say, oh, okay, I heard you. And I'll count and I'll tell them, you know, this is like the 10th time you've done that. And they'll look at me, what? They don't even realize they're using the word. But what I tell them is, you are going to be a professional. You are going to be working in the medical field. Do you really think your patients who are coming in to see you want to hear you say, oh, how was your effing day? And they just, they look at me and they laugh and they'll tell me, Ms. Chavez. And I say effing, I don't say the word. And they'll look at me and they'll say, Ms. Chavez, why are you saying that? Well, how would you feel if your doctor talked to you that way? Well, he can't. Why not? Can you close that door for me, please? Like, why not? Okay, then my question to you is, 
why are you going to talk to them that way? Is it going to be, why not? And they'll just look at me, oh. It takes me a little while to get them not to use the foul language. But by the end of the fifth week, sixth week, they're all acting professional, talking nice, being respectful. And not because the rule is there, no profanity allowed, not just like that, but because I keep telling them and joking around with them. Oh, look at that. And I'll just sometimes do that. Um, I also have, like one time I had the students, you know, one student who did it all the time and I said, okay, here's the deal. For every time you say that word, it's going to be one minute that you're going to come and be in my classroom. And this kid, he did like 120 minutes. He did it like in a whole week, 120 minutes. And I told him, I said, okay, don't forget, after school on Thursday, you're coming here for half an hour. And then tomorrow, the next day, you're going to be another half hour until you make 120. But Ms. Chavez, you're going to be my helper. You're going to put things away. You're going to clean. You're going to do this. And he's like, really? I said, yeah, I'm going to tell my mom. I said, go ahead. Tell her why. <laughs> tell her why you have to stay after school. <laughs> and you know, the mom called me. She called me and said, Ms. Chavez, is it true that you're making my son stay after school these many minutes? For, for four days, he had to come. He says, because he was using foul language. I said, yes, ma'am. I hope you don't mind, but I'm trying to teach him that if you're going to become a doctor, if you're going to become a nurse, if you're working as a medical assistant, and remember, they leave here certified so that they can actually work. They can't be using the language. And she says, Ms. Chavez, that's awesome. I have, been, I have been trying to get him to stop using the foul language, the bad language, especially the F word. And I said, oh, <laughs> you don't mind? And she says, no, please continue. <laughs> and then his mom started doing that too. She said, for every, every time you say that word, you're going to do a, 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 a chore, chore at home. So he came back and he told me, man, Ms. Chavez, that's not fair. You talked to my mom. And I said, yeah, she called me. Of course I talked to your mom. And he said, I said she was going to get mad at you. I said, but instead, now I have to do things over the weekend for every time I say a bad word. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. She's actually helping me make you a professional. And she, he just looked at me, nodded his head, and said, okay, I give up. <laughs> so, and you know what happened with that young man? He actually went on to be a psych tech, went to the college, came back, and ended up inviting me to his wedding and told me, Ms. Chavez, you make me work so hard that I'm never going to forget you. And I was like, wow. That's how I felt. It was really nice. But yet, I was strict, but I wasn't mean. And I think that's what got through to them that I wanted them to be able to do this without, you know, doing it. So rules are important. Procedures are important. Any comments, questions? Okay. Have any questions? She can hear you on this camera right there in case anybody has any questions. So these are my rules. No gum chewing, no profanity. Conduct yourself professionally at all times. Clean up after using any and all equipment. These are rules. Which one of these is not a rule? Uh, B, right? No, wait, no, that's a lie. A. B is a rule. B. B, respect and structure. No. Yeah, respect. <laughs> It's actually both, A and B. Oh, oh. Perfect question. <laughs> but here's the thing. Respect the instructor and those around you. See, this is an expectation. It's not a rule. For me, it's an expectation. I tell them, you have to respect the people around you. You have to respect your classmates. You have to respect the people you work with. So, you know, I expect you to do that. To me, that's not a rule. And then I, I have students tell me, Ms. Chavez, but my other teachers put that as a rule, respect those around you, respect me. And I said, and that's a good rule. But here's the thing, I expect you to do this just because that's the kind of person you are. This is what I expect that your parents have taught you. So I expect you to do this. It's not a rule I'm gonna give you. 
But if something goes wrong, I'm gonna tell you, you know, you need to remember to respect each other. So in this case, because I expect it from them, and I do talk about it at the beginning of the year and tell them, you're in a class, you have to respect. You have to respect people's culture, people's ideas, uh, their background, everything you do, because when you're working in the medical field, you're gonna meet so many people from different areas and you don't have a choice. You have to be understanding and respectful. So to me, it's not a rule. To me, it's an expectation. How do you feel about that? Good. <laughs> do, you, do you think I should make it a rule or do you think I should just continue expecting it? Continue uh -huh. expecting, yeah. Why? Because that should be like a custom trait for everyone. I agree. I agree. I don't feel it should be a rule. I feel it's something that we all should say, you know what? We're teaching CTE. We're teaching careers. This is an expectation of what you have to do. That's a life skill. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. uh, exactly. <clears throat> so this is why I don't make it a rule. I discuss it. I tell them you have to do this. This is part of being you. This is part of being in the field. Just like uh, taking a blood pressure. Of course, I'm talking about my field, right? Taking a blood pressure has to become second nature. My students will take a blood pressure, a pulse or respiration in a matter of within five minutes or less. By the end of the first semester, they're doing it five minutes or less. That quickly and accurately. And they, you know, of course, while they're learning and training, you have to practice, you have to learn it, you have to make a mistake. And that's what I'm, that's why I'm helping them. That's why I'm training them, right? But by the end of it, when they're out there doing everything on their own, they're in there and out of there and quick. Because it's my expectation, right? It's the procedure they have to follow and I teach it and knowing the rules and expectations, that's what it is. Now we're gonna go, oh, do you guys have any questions so far? Before I get into time management. Yeah. Okay, so now I have two different pictures. Which would you rather be? The first picture on the left or the one on the right? Which picture? Now the person on all these desks, if you look here, doing so many diff different things that by that time he's getting frustrated as he goes along, right? Uh, I don't want to be that. Have you guys ever had a day where you're frustrated with everything you do? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. I'm one of those two. I'm going to raise my head and say, absolutely. And then over here on the right side, she has finished Project Friday. Everything stacked up neatly. Everything said. She has a to-do list. That's a good thing. We aim for. Yeah. <laughs> now, is that something that happens to everybody? No, let me tell you a little story. Oh, by the way, am I talking too much, too many stories? No, no, no we like them. <laughs> Good? Okay, so I'm going to be honest with you. I am a daydreamer. I am a reader. I love to read my books. And I'm going to say I'm a procrastinator. Not purposely, though. It's just because I'll get into what I'm doing or when I tune people out. In my house, it gets really hectic. And when my kids were little, it really got hectic. So I would get to the point, I need some quiet time. I would go read a book and I would get into my book and I would tune everything out. Then they come and they say, mom, mom. And before you know it, mom. And then I was like, what? And they're like, I was talking to you. And I, was, and I told them, I tuned you out because all you do is screaming and fighting with each other and arguing and whatever you're doing and laughing and everything that I have to tune you out. So you guys either have to be quiet and calm and, you know, say, excuse me, mom. You know, I always gave them magic words. You know what my magic words are? And I use this with my students in the class and I tell them, you know what? There's five magic words that actually work with me. Excuse me. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry. If they need to, 
You know, there's different words that you use, and please. And so when they come up and ask me, and sometimes they'll be not quite so nice, and I'll say, hey, you guys, how come I haven't heard any magic words around here? And they'll look at me, oh, sorry about that, Miss Chavez. And the next thing you know, it's like, can I borrow that, please? You know, well, thank you for lending that to me or whatever the case may be. And before you know it, they start doing that. And they'll ask me, why, the, why are those magic words? And I told them, I would tell them, because that's how I taught my kids when they were little. In order to remind them to say, excuse me, or thank you, or please don't. When they interrupted, I told them, you know what? You can't interrupt an adult in a conversation. You have to wait for a pause and then you say, excuse me. And then you ask. So I told my students the same thing. Are you going to interrupt the doctor? when he's talking to the nurse about a procedure or whatever the case may be? No. Well, it's the same thing here. You're learning to be a professional, right? So you have to wait, pause and say, excuse me. Or you need to raise your hand and talk. In my classroom, I treat them like college students. I don't treat them like high school students. And I tell them, you don't have to raise your hand, but you have to be respectful. If you have to answer, say it. If you have a comment, say it, but be respectful. And they do. Sometimes they raise their hand when they have something really important and I'll, and I'll call them and I'll say, okay. But when we have major discussions, they don't raise their hands. They don't wait to do that. They just get into the discussion and it's actually really great, really cool. But they know their limitations and they know that when we have a discussion, you can get excited, but you can't yell and you can't put people down because I always tell them again, you have to respect each other from the beginning. Time management, very important. What is time management? The analysis of how working hours are spent, prioritization of tasks in order to maximize personal efficiency in the workplace. Why? <laughs> I will tell you, time gets away from me. When I'm in the classroom and we're doing something great and they're so engaged and I'm having fun and I see their eyes are shiny and bright. We'll get into it. And at the beginning, we will get so into it and go, and before you know it, the bell rings and it was like, oh my goodness. And then I'll have to frantically, I would, I used to say, frantically say, don't forget this is homework. Don't forget to put that away. Don't forget to do that. Time management. I had to learn and I do this every day. Oh, by the way, I'll show you. I just got my new teacher planner book. I'm planning everything. Why? Because for me on paper, it's, for some reason, I still enjoy doing things on paper. But I plan my things like for my lessons. I know five minutes before class is over, I have to remind them, okay, do this and then let's put everything away. Um, for example, if we're doing a urinalysis, does anybody want to come in and see urine cups on the table, on the counter? No, it has to be put away. But we get so into what we're doing that if we don't have time management, if I'm not on it, the bell will ring and they will just walk out. Can't have that. I have to teach them. So, and I tell them, I said, you know what? You guys have to be on me like I'm going to be on you. And they laugh. And I said, hey, I'm human too, right? I'm not perfect. And, and they laugh because I have a lot of knowledge and they think I know everything. They'll ask me questions and for the most part, I can answer almost anything. And then they'll laugh when I tell them, no, 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 that's my, that's my bad part. And I know I start daydreaming or I'll go off or something else and I'll say, no, I can't do that. So I have to make a to-do list. I have to prioritize. And I've learned it the hard way. So time management, I'm just saying it's very important, you guys. So I'm going to ask you right now, in your classroom, how many of you guys do time management? How many of you guys actual uh, multitask, prioritize, schedule, have an agenda? How many of you schedule your time in the classroom? I see a couple of hands. How many of you have already taught and are out there? Because I know some of you have. And how many of you lose track of time? Have anyone ever lost track of time? Yeah, easy. Yeah. 
Yeah. How many of you, have any of you ever had that experience like I have, that you're so into what you're doing, the bell rings, and then you're like, oh, I didn't even realize the time, the hour was over? <clears throat> no? Next lesson. Yes. <laughs> I have a funny story. So I was oh. teaching a workshop uh -huh. on time management, <laughs> and I ran out of time. Time management, and you missed it, and you didn't get it, and you didn't finish on time. And yeah. those, things, those things really happen, you guys. That's why I told you these are the things that I feel are important. Time management is important. I do create a to do list, I do value my time, I do my multitasking. I stay after school a lot doing grading and doing things I need to do and everything. And so much so that my friend Sherry, she's my CRS, she, she will tell me, my CGS, she will tell me, she will text me or call me on her way out and say, hey, Marta, are you still in school? Yeah, I see your, I see your car, go home. <laughs> she's done that a few times. And I'll, and I'll just say, oh, okay. I wasn't paying attention to the time and I get into what I'm doing, I forget. My kids, my family, they all know. If I'm not home at five o'clock, oh, she's still in the classroom. And they'll call me and they'll say, hey mom, what time are you leaving? And I'll look at the time and I'll go, oh my God, it's five o'clock or six o'clock, I'm out of here. And it's not on purpose. I love what I do and I love to be prepared and I love to be able to have the students do what they need, you know? So, and I like to make it interesting and I like to tell them stories. So I like to prepare, but I wasn't like that all the time. I learned the hard way, but I do it. So this is one of the things that I feel that it's important that you guys make sure, just like you have your lesson plan and you create your lesson plan and everything is up to it, you have to follow it because sometimes you miss it out. But here's the thing, every rule is meant to be broken sometimes or can be broken because if my kids are so involved in everything and instead of teaching that lesson in one day and I have to go on to the next day to teach it, I will do that. Because here, I, if, if I think something is going to be boring and they're not going to want to do it and they get so involved in it, and that's when I surprise myself and I'm like, wow, I made this so interesting. And if I think it's boring, I think they're going to be bored, but they're not always that way. And they do it. And so I will break that and I'll say, okay, we'll continue this tomorrow. Because when they're having a good time learning, I want them to continue. So I want you guys to write down on your, on a sheet of paper or anything like that. You know how we have the to-do list here. So just a quick little thing right now. Our class take the seat, they sign in, second, I tell them, take out your laptop, be ready to work. And then this one says, it, pull out your midterm, bear bell work, I'm making attempts. It's a routine I have them do. So I want you to write down the first three things that you would like your students to do when they come in. What will be your steps? What fits for you? How would you do it? And I'm gonna be asking you guys to tell me. Marta, you cut out for a second. Can you briefly repeat that? Oh, okay, oh. yes. Uh, my um, comment was, when I come into the classroom, I have a routine I follow. First, I tell them, make sure you sign in, come in, get to your seat, then take out your laptop, be ready to work, and then I tell them, do your bell work. When they're doing their bell work, that's when I take their attendance. So I would like you to write down the first three steps that you'd like them to do when they come into the classroom. Thank you. And I would like for you to share it with me afterwards. Now, this is routine for them. Once I get them into the routine, they'll come in, we'll be done in about six to seven minutes. 
because signing in, they walk in, they sign in, then they go to their seat. And if I have 25 students, you know, it's going to take them two minutes. But during that time, I take that time to start taking the attendance. Because at the, the first week, I'll call out their names. But after the second week, by the second week, I already know their names completely. Because my problem is not remembering their names. My problem is putting the name to the face. So the first week I take attendance. After that, I don't. I don't do it orally. After that, I just do it quietly and put it down. Once I know who they are, that's also where having a seating chart makes a difference as well. Because I, I'll use the seating chart too. If I don't remember a student's name, I'll look at the seating chart. I won't call out their name, but I'll look at the seating chart and make sure, and then I'll go, oh yeah, that's who that is. But I always make a game on the first day to memorize their names. She's giving, oh, no, time. She's, just very she's giving you time. I'm just giving you time. If you guys are done, I would like for you guys to share with me. Tell me what class you teach and what your first three steps would be. I I think I'll be uh, uh, I think I'll take advantage of the fact that I know Wendy. And Wendy, can you start? <laughs> okay. uh, my to sign in, log into the computer in Google Classroom, and then get started on their bell work for their class activity. Okay. You notice she said sign in, so you have the students sign in. How do you have them sign in? I have uh, printed out sign in sheets that I um, they check off their initials next to their name every day. Okay, that's exactly what I do. Exactly the same kind of sign in sheet that I have. Excellent. Would somebody else like to share? I'll share part of I do the same thing. I learned the things that mean signing in is very important. So I have the students sign in. I have them do their do now that's already on the projector, uh, rather than a, uh, a riddle sometimes with a quote and they have to ask questions about it. Mm -hmm. And then I take a few minutes to go over uh, what the assignment is going to be for the day. Okay. And has it become routine for them to automatically do it? Yes. They you know. They, when they come in and I uh, say good morning or I'm at the door normally, they go straight to the, in line is on the clipboard or the back of the back and they walk in, they sign in, they take their seat, the do now is there, they get their journal, and they put their do now in the journal, put it on the screen. And they need to work. So it's systemic that it happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, because I know this, it, it actually becomes routine for them. And it's an expectation they have. And I noticed that my subs, when I've had subs, Deborah, you can say they would automatically go and do that, right? When they, you walked yeah. into the classroom? Yeah, I'm like in your classroom, it's right in front of the desk. So you have an opportunity. I believe it used to be, is it still? that they come in and sign the sign the sheet with like right by the desk. Mm -hmm. And that's what they do, it's routine. And they know, they know my expectations. I don't have it written down, when a sub comes in, you have to do this. I just tell them, you know what? You guys need to respect the sub, don't take advantage of them. I have assigned work and they will talk to you and they will joke with you and they will do it, but you have to do the work. And they're pretty respectful. So it's just that this expectation Again, it's expectation and routine. So classroom management, part of it is about routine and expectations. But do I have to write down every single, single little expectation? No. The other thing is, can you change your rules in the middle of the year? What do you think? Probably not a good idea. Not successfully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, not <laughs> well, here's the thing. When they have 
the rules are cat and everything is good and you've got into another level, I will change and add another rule. I'll tell them, you know what? You guys have done this rule so great that I'm going to add this other rule and take that one off. <laughs> and if I need to change it and add a rule or do something because we're doing something different, I'll do that. And they'll just look and they'll say, oh, that's a challenge. And the next thing you know, they follow it and they get it. That's the new rule. They've learned not to argue with my rules and they just do it. And I tell them, you know what, this is because now you're in a medical system one, now you're giving injections. This is a new rule you have to follow because you have to be able to know the, the patient rights. You have to know that you have to check that medication three times and make sure that it's the right medication. You have to make sure that it's not expired. You have to make sure that it's the right patient. So all these things, so you have to do it, it's routine. And at first they, they, they have a hard time, but then before you know it, again, it's routine. And so I'll keep adding more and more and more. And I feel because I do that, that's why when they're medical assistants, the hospitals don't call me and tell me, or the clinic, Marta, when are your kids coming in? Sometimes I forget in January to start preparing and I'll get a phone call and I'll answer, I'll, you know, I'll either take it or they leave me a message and I'll be, oh my God, it's time for me to start setting up internships. And they tell me, we love your kids. Arrowhead, I'm going to boast a little bit here, but I'm really proud of my kids because at Arrowhead, they will call me and tell me, you know what? And they've told me, your kids sometimes, your kids will replace the CAs here. They come in, one day they job shadow or half a day and then they're on it. And they're taking over the CAs that are, or the medical assistants, they call them CAs, that are actually on vacation. And they'll send them out on vacation while my kids are there for that one month. And they're comfortable with my kids because they say they have the knowledge. And that makes me very proud. And, and that's what I tell my students. This is what's going to happen. And I have students and kids, old students come in who are doing things and different things. And they talk to them and explain to them. And they say, hey, Miss Chavez is mean, huh? And they'll laugh. And they'll say, yeah, but it's worth it. Because look at where I am now. Does anyone, can anyone else share their first steps? Don't be shy. I picked on Wendy and Deborah pitched in because they know me, but the rest of you guys, come on. It's okay. Does everyone do the same thing we do? First, take your seat, take out the laptop, be ready to work, do your bell work, or are there other stuff that you do? We're all different CTE teachers, so we may do things differently, and that's okay. I need something so can you hear me? I do something similar than what you do, but since I'm doing uh, intro to public services, back when I started in law enforcement, um, mm -hmm. we do uh, handwritten patrol logs. So like for their warm up for the day, I'm gonna have them sit down and kind of start writing down what's already happened in their day. That's actually, really, that's actually really good. That's really cool. I will tell you that in my bell work, I review the things that we did the day before. Sometimes it will be uh, work with the things that are coming up and they actually have to sit there and research. And sometimes it's like a review, it's a quiz and I'll put up there, what is this and what is that and what is that? And they have less than five minutes to just do it. Yeah. And yeah, and that's great because like I said, we're all different. So are we all going to do the same things? No, but are we all going to have a routine for them that we expect them to do? I think so, right? Absolutely. Okay, so here is another little assignment. I have found that if I have a poor start for my class, it's a weak class for everybody. But if I have a strong start to the class, everyone has a good class and everyone's working and everyone is willing to help each other. So based on your class, I want you to write down what a problem class will be for you and what the solution would be. How would you create it into a, sorry, how would you create it into, wow. How would you create it into a strong class? I don't know what happened to my computer. Sorry, guys.
So, but what would be what would be that? I really want to know. What the heck is going on? Oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, I guess like a poor start would be an unorganized start, or one where you haven't thoroughly planned out what it is that you're going to be having your students engage in for the day. Mm -hmm. Versus a strong start, a solution for that problem would be being prepared and organized with whatever materials it is that you need to even begin the class instruction. Mm -hmm. That way you're you're mindful and efficient with your own time as well as the student's time, as well as their attention, which is about the size of a nap. So they should <laughs> be spending the day. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> That's really good. Okay, someone else. I think if there isn't a do now assignment at the beginning, then if you start the class like by just letting them sit, even if it's just a moment or two, the idle time, then it starts the class on that note. Um, you don't have to that is it. true. If there's a moment or two at the end, while well, that's not necessarily good, um, that ends up being like a reflection time. So that mm -hmm. a moment or two at the end is okay, but a moment or two at the beginning is bad. It's like starting off on the wrong foot, and then you can't really get your stride. There's no do now assignment. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very true, I, and I like your point. Let me tell you, um, after lunchtime, kids come in, and I had one class one year that the kids would come in right after lunch and they would just put their head down or they would want to take a nap. So one time I got really tired of that because I kept telling them, you know, come on, we need to. So one time I surprised them and I said, everyone stand up. And they're like, what? Everyone stand up. Everyone's sleepy, right? And they're like, yeah, okay, so here's what we're going to do today. And they just looked at me like, you're being weird. Yeah. And I said, everyone wants to do this, so we're going to do this. So we need, we're going to be practicing vital signs. We're going to be practicing pulse. And they were like, what? So everyone stand up. Here's what we're going to do first. We're going to do jumping jacks. They all did jumping jacks for one minute. And of course they whined. And then I said, okay, <laughs> now take each other's pulse. And they took the pulse and they wrote it down and they did the routine thing. And I said, okay, now everyone put your head down for five minutes. We're going to take a nap. And they looked at me like, what? Just, and then a couple of things, shh, 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 just do it, just do it, just do it. So I took it five and they took a nap for about three minutes. I didn't make it five, but it felt like five. Then I said, okay, you guys, turn in the light. Now take each other's pulse. And they said, Ms. Chavez, it went down 20 points. I said, it did. You notice the difference when you're active and when you're sleeping and relaxed, how it changes? That's how it changes throughout the day. So I let them take their nap because they were really bad, but I turned it into a lesson, which worked out for both of us because after that, they were ready to go. And it was a three minute little nap, but actually I do a lesson like that. And I have them, I have them. I usually, what I do is I have half the, half the class sit and the other class nap. But this time I did the whole class so that everyone could um, take that little nap. And they were tired afterwards. They woke up refreshed and they got going. So can you change things up in your classroom? Absolutely. You want to try to make everything a lesson, a teachable moment? Absolutely. And that's what this is about, not telling you what to do, just being creative and doing different things, because it's okay to do different things. Does anyone else want to share their problem and their solution? Am I boring you guys? No? Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, let's continue then. I have some car cartoons here for you. Our unruly kids in the classroom. I, and I hope you appreciate this one because I thought it was cute.
You know how you have the kids take out their phones and they want to text all the time? So I do have problems sometimes with the phone. Okay. The other thing we need to do is student behavior. Be aware of student behavior. Student behavior can impact the way other students react. And of course, takes away from teaching time when we have to stop and correct it. That also means we lose student engagement and it becomes difficult to bring them back on task. And I know we all have had those days. I particularly had a day like that one time where one student was acting bad, called a student across the room and told them to F off. And the next thing you know, the other student started back and I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? And it was across the room. It was one person was here and the other one was way on the other side. And I have tables. So it was from one corner to another corner. And I was like, oh my goodness, what, what am I going to do? What's going on? What's happening here? How the heck did this happen? And I'm going to tell you, I never saw it coming, but they had an issue outside of the classroom. <clears throat> and they hang out with different friends and they were in the same classroom and all of a sudden it started. And I got up and I said, what the heck is going on here? You guys need to stop this and be quiet. And they just kept going. So I just told them, you know what? I am going to give you an opportunity. You stop now. One of you go to the other classroom. One of you stay here because I have two classrooms. I have my lab in the classroom. I said, if you don't do that, I will call security and have them take you. And they both looked at me. One of them sat down and said, it's okay. I don't have a problem. I can work as long as, does, as, long as he doesn't talk to me. And the other person was like, he couldn't handle it. And I just said, Let's go to the other room. And I, I mean, you know, and I left them the work and I assigned the work and I walked with them to the other classroom. And I asked him, what the heck is going on? You know, high school kids, right? A friend did something to another friend. And before you know it, they got involved because of their friends. And so I literally talked to him for about seven, eight minutes. And I told him, you know what? Is this the kind of friends that you guys want? Is this what you want to do? Is this what you're going to do at, at a job? Is this, are you going to let everything bother you? You know, at work, teachable moment, right? I said, at work, you're always going to have someone you don't like. That's part of life. Are you going to attack them, call them names, do things when you're at work? Well, no. Well, this is your job, remember? This is your job. You signed in. You're doing this. At the end of the week, I'll take out candy, snacks, different things. You earn it. I'll give them tickets. And then at the end of the month, they can buy and get whatever snack they want. And I tell them, is, is this how you're going to be acting? Because if this is how you're going to be acting at work and with patients, we can't do it. And then he just, well, Ms. Chavez, it wasn't fair. I said, okay, talk about it, relax, and then we'll discuss it quietly. And then afterwards, I told him, okay, you need to get back to work, come back into the classroom. Just ignore him and just do your work. That's all that matters. Did I give him time from away from the classroom? Yes. But my kids were so respectful and they knew what they had to do that they just went ahead and did the work, the written work. And when I came back, I said, okay, anyone have any questions? Let's get, and I did the class the rest of it and it stayed calm. But Honestly, at that point in time, I should have known because I saw them tense. I saw the face, but I didn't react immediately. And as a medical person, I should, I'm always paying attention. But this time it got away from me. But again, what was I able to do, you guys? The one thing I was able to do was not have to call security which to me was a big thing. Because if I call security, both of them are going to go to the principal, both of them are going to be written up. And I wrote up a report and I told them both, you know what? I'm going to, I have this report here. I'm going to have it right here in my drawer. I'm not going to send it up, but you guys have to show me that deserves it because next time it's going up. And they both thanked me for the opportunity of not having to get in trouble. One of them had already had trouble before, and if he went to the principal, they would have suspended him. And he turned around. 
And it was just me taking a little extra time to talk to him. And then what I'm saying is sometimes just giving that student the little bit of attention that they don't have or they don't get, you know, makes a difference. Marta, we have about five minutes remaining. Okay, so go ahead. Well, the, the main thing here is this, um, teachers, you have to be consistent in order for everything to happen. Um, he has the PowerPoint so that you guys can um, do that. Here, I'm gonna go really quick. Five things I expect from my students. Courtesy, respect, cooperation, responsibility, and team effort. And I tell them, you do all these things, you go, you're going to be successful. This is what I expect from them. Ten ways to flip a kid. Um, I really believe this. I'll tell my students, you know, it's okay. You made a mistake, but I believe in you. I'll do something extra for them. I try to use grace in my discipline and try to understand where they're coming from. I try to notice the kids who need extra attention and give it to them, even if it's just a tap on the shoulder as I walk by. Number four, be genuinely interested in your students. To me, it's important. So, and be positive. So just a little thing here. Uh, arrive to your class, have your syllabus, have your discipline, classroom rules, structure, follow through on your discipline, you guys. Your discipline rules is important to follow through with your consequences. All I have to do is one time show that I mean it and everyone pays attention. I've come to a frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom. It is my mood that makes the weather. As a teacher, you possess a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. You can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. You can humil humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, you know, it's our responsibility, it's my response, your response, that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated, and a child humanized or dehumanized. I got this quote a while back, a friend gave it to me, and every time I read it, I say, yeah, you know what, it's true. My mood, if I'm in a good mood and I treat the kids with a smile and everything, we have a good day. If I'm having a bad day and I let that show and I let it affect my mood, then we have a bad day. Or you can snap at a kid and it's not fair when they don't deserve it, right? The other thing I want to tell you guys here is this one. The most valuable resource that all teachers have is each other. Without collaboration, our growth is limited to our own perspective. We can't just go by our perspective. We have to help each other. And this is my last thing, resources. Honestly, you guys, your resources, your PMs, your CGS, and your peers. Why do I say that? First of all, we all have different districts. We all have di different PMs, right? At the same time, we have to follow our district rules as well as ROP rules, and we have to make sure that they're good. And who better than your PMs can help you with that? If you have a question, don't hesitate to call them because they will answer your question. Any doubts you have, they'll take care of it. Your CGS, oh my God, you have no idea how much I depend on my CGS. She will come, she will help me, she'll answer my questions, she'll help me with the different things I have. She'll come talk to the class. She'll help me with interviews. She'll help me with anything that I need. And if she has, she doesn't know, she'll tell me, I'll find out for you. And your peers. Don't forget that your teachers in your school, they can help you. Whether they're new or whether they're the older teachers that have been there, they will help you. Last of all, I'm at Grand Terrace High School. But please, you can feel free to call me and ask me any question you have. I'm here to help. Um, once again, let's give Marta a huge round of applause. Thank you so much, Marta. Oh, thank you for asking me to do this. Thank it was fun, so and I appreciate it.